Hey there, Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com here for episode number 102 of Goulet Q&A. This is the first kind of getting back to normal with our Q&A because episode 100 was a shop tour. If you haven't checked that out, please do. Maybe Jenny can link it up here a little bit. That would be great. Um, and then episode number 101 followed it up with an uh, interview with Dante Del Vecchio, the founder of Visconti. You can link that up maybe over here. Woo. Switch it up. Um, so those were some pretty epic, awesome Q and A's. And I knew as soon as they published that I would be setting you up for disappointment when 102 came out because I'm just kind of back to normal, back to me. So I've chosen some questions. It's gonna be a little weird this week. I'll just be completely honest with you because number 102 is not publishing until November 13th. Um, however, the day that I'm actually shooting it is November 2nd. So I'm shooting it way far in advance, more in advance than I've ever shot a Q&A because I'm gonna be out of town for a lot of next week, which is the week before, or the week of the publishing of this video. So I'm trying to shoot it in advance. I have a bunch of other things booked up. The best block of time I could get was uh, Monday. So it's, it's kind of weird. I'm shooting it almost two weeks in advance and I'm sorry for that, but hey, I figure it's better to have it in advance than not have it at all. So some of the pertinent updates and timeliness is gonna be a little bit off. So I'm gonna to have to speak in some generalities here. So if you haven't checked out episode 100 and 101 of the Q&A, please do so and comment on those because I'd love your feedback on both of them. Um, and then I'm also curious to know if you liked last week's with Dante, um, or would you be interested in me doing more interview style Q&As. I've done it where I've had interviewed Nathan Tardif on the phone in the past, but then I went to interview Brian Gray uh, and now Dante Del Vecchio. So are you interested in me finding more people to interview? Because if you are, that's something I can pursue. It's a little bit more to coordinate. It's a little harder for me to do that. But if you really like it, uh, I could explore that more. So let me know in the comments if you're interested in that. Um, some product related stuff we've had going on. We've launched the Omas Ojiba Cocktails, the Visconti Millennium Arc Moonlights, the Visconti Crimson Tide Limited Edition, which is an exclusive to Goulet um, in both the rose gold and then the black finish. I'm not sure if we'll have the black finish in time for when this video publishes, but it should be coming very soon if we don't have it already. Um, the Visconti Saturnos, again, don't know exactly when they're launching. Hopefully by the time this video posts, not sure, not a fortune teller or a future person, future psychic. That's what I'm thinking of. Wow. Um, Twisby 580 all blue we've gotten in. It's like, like a sky blue, it's a nice blue. Um, and then the Quaco Skyline Sport in purple, which is a US exclusive, and then metallic purple. Not sure what the status on the metallic purple is as of the shooting of this video. Who knows what it'll come two weeks from now. And then the Pilot Metropolitan Retro Pops, hopefully will have come and be available by the time this video launches. So. Lots of products coming out. A lot of uh, manufacturers come out with new stuff for the holiday season. We don't have a ton that's going to be released from now until the holidays. So hopefully you can catch your breath a little bit because I know we've been launching just a ton of new stuff, which is great, but also very tiring on the wallet. So um, hopefully we'll be able to all kind of chill out a little bit here before the holidays. Anyway, let's get to some questions this week. I only have nine of them. Just didn't have a lot of questions this past week. I think everybody had stuff going on with Halloween and all that kind of stuff, which now you're thinking like, Halloween, who knows? We're thinking about turkey. But, uh, you know, Halloween just happened this past weekend as of when I'm shooting it, so um, didn't do a whole lot of stuff. Rachel and I aren't huge Halloween fans. We have our own personal um, stuff. We had something that didn't happen great that, uh, Halloween years ago, so it's not a great association for us. So we get... We, we appreciate Get Dressed Up and the kids and all that kind of stuff, but we don't get like super into it for our own reasons. But anyway, um, that has nothing to do with q and I don't know why I shared all that. But anyway, <laughs> let's get into the questions this week. I think everybody was busy with Halloween. That's what, what I was getting at. Um, okay, so starting out with a couple of pen and writing questions from at Classic Urge on Twitter. The best way, pen and ink, to write on thermal paper. Do you give up and use a ballpoint? All right, thermal paper, I'm, I'm thinking like, like the shiny like fax machine paper. I don't know who uses a fax machine anymore. Uh, I literally never owned one. Um, but um, I'm thinking like that or maybe like receipts or I know like the, the shipping labels that we use are thermal. Um, 
but uh, there's so I think there's like different degrees of thermal paper so it's hard for me to say exactly uh, what we're dealing with but I know that in general thermal paper is rather not uh, fountain pen friendly uh, I would say probably you're gonna have to use an alternate pen you know if there was any ink combination that could possibly work the finest nib possible and then probably like a platinum carbon black would probably work okay because it's a pigmented ink um, and it's going to dry on top of the paper. It's not going to require to soak in the paper, such as like a Noodler's permanent ink would. I do think that the carbon black would give you probably the best chance of anything that you'd be able to. But notoriously, when you have inks that have a heavy coating on them, like postcards or photo paper or anything like that, it's almost impossible because ink is water-based. So that's where you really need like pretty much a ballpoint pen that's got like a paste ink in it, even those might not be great. Um, but that's usually when you use like a Sharpie or some kind of like solvent based ink, um, which you, they don't make those in fountain pen inks. Um, it's all water based. So um, pretty much carbon black and an extra fine nib. Uh, but I would say don't be surprised if it's just not going to work, depending on the quality of the paper that you're using. Um, that would probably go beyond of where fountain pens would become practical. Next question, Sarah M on Facebook asks, I dream of a pen that is, bear with me, piston fill, extra fine nib, and with a cap that doesn't screw on, and around about $60 or less. All right, four different parameters there. Little specific for where I usually like to go with a Q&A, but I've said what the heck, I usually like to throw these in every now and then. All right, less being better, does such a pen exist? Most of the ones I've seen that are all close have screw caps. Okay, so basically, you know, snap cap or a magnetic cap or something like that. The $60 range is going to be a little bit constricting in that way, um, but may, the most constricting part is going to be the screw cap. It sounds like you're already pretty aware of that, Sarah. You've probably done some research. We do have fascinated search on gulaypens.com, so you can actually go through and you can click and say, I want. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have a exclusion for screw cap pens, but you can select everything that's not screw caps. So you can select snap cap, you can select magnetic, um, and you can, you can narrow down all of your options. You can have a price range. The price range though, we don't have like, you can't say $60 or less. You can say zero to 25, 25 to 50. What I would rather do is search by all of the other criteria, and then you can just search low to high. Uh, as a filter and then you can see what's going to fit in your range. But I did this search based on all your criteria here. So I did piston fill, extra fine nib, magnetic or snap cap, and then I just looked at the price. There were only two pens that came up. Uh, the Lamy 2000 and the Lamy 2000 stainless steel, both of which are well above your $60 range. So I have nothing for you. Nothing with all of the criteria to meet, Sarah. So you're going to have to decide what is most important to you. I can't tell based on what that's going to be. Since you said piston fill, I'm going to say that that probably is most important. You said that first, um, and you said the price last. So, I mean, the only thing, Lamy 2000 is the only thing that meets all of your criteria, except for the price. Lamy 2000 is a fantastic pen. So I highly recommend it if that is something that can be within your budget. If not, if you got to stick within your budget, and it sounds like the screw cap might be a bigger deal, um, then you can get a snap cap, what I would recommend for a snap cap, if you're willing to compromise on the piston fill, because to get a, to get any piston fill less than $60, you're just really not going to get it. The only company that, there's two companies that I, I have that have piston fill that's less than $60. Noodlers, which they're all gonna be flex pens, which that's a whole other bird. None of them are extra fine nibs, so I kind of ruled them out, but it is something to consider. They're all screw cap though. The only other thing is Twisby. Twisby has actually several different pens. They got the Eco, the Mini, the 580, the Classic, which I forgot to grab. Um, but those are all under $60. So those would fit. They all have extra fine nib options, I think. Yes. Um, so those would be certainly something that I would highly recommend, um, especially the Eco. Um, but they're all screw cap. So you're going to have to compromise on something. If you want the cap, if you want the easier removable cap, and you're willing to compromise on the piston, I would recommend a Pilot Metropolitan. And the reason is because the Metropolitan with the supplied converter is going to be almost the ink capacity of a Twisby Mini. I know you think of piston fillers as being such, you know, oh my gosh, it gets so much greater ink capacity. And that's often true, but the Mini um, doesn't really hold that much more ink than the Con 20 here. 
Um, well, technically it's not a Con 20. It's the same capacity as a Con 20. I'm all over the place today. But snap cap, $15. It's kind of tough. You can get four of these for your $60 price range. So um, I would consider those, consider a Metropolitan maybe, or a Twisby. Um, you know, or you could fit a Lamy in, in the mix as well if you wanted to. It's a snap cap, but then it's also converter, but the converter in capacity is less than the Metropolitan. So I was trying to meet you halfway there. So basically you're gonna have to pick and choose what you want to sacrifice on because nothing is gonna meet all of your criteria. All right, got a couple of ink questions this week. Donovan P on Facebook says, so I've been learning more about highlighter inks and I'm wondering if you can use highlighter inks in normal fountain pens just to write with. Also, gotta love these two-part questions. Can you use a highlighter pen to highlight something else that was written in fountain pen ink? Okay, so good. Still talking about highlighters, great. Um, so can you use normal highlighter ink such as um, you know, let's see your Private Reserve Chartreuse, Noodler's Firefly, any of the Noodler's Dragon Cat inks. Uh, can you use those as regular ink? The answer is yes. It's formulated to be able to work in a fountain pen. However, if you're using it in, say, a Metropolitan with a fine nib or an even medium nib, you're going to write it, but you're not going to be able to read it, you know, because it's going to be so light. It's meant to be blah, brushed on with a broad stroke. And if you're writing with it with a fine pen, yes, it'll work but you won't be able to see it very well. So really, if you want to use it in a regular fountain pen, pretty much the intended use is going to be to use a fountain pen as a highlighter, not as an actual pen with written letters. So one of the best pens that I think to use as a fountain pen highlighter, if you will, is the uh, Pilot Parallels. Sorry, it took me a second to think of what it was called there. There's a lot of P words in the pen world. Um, I think the best one is going to be either the 2.4 millimeter or the 3.8 millimeter. So there's four different sizes, the 1.5 and then the six millimeter are gonna be kind of outside the range of what's practical for a highlighter. But these ones are nice because they're, they're kind of like a stub nib where it's like a flat blade as a nib. So you can take these, you can load them up with, fountain, uh, with a highlighter ink and you can use them as highlighters, um, but they will not wear down uh, and clog up like the felt tip highlighters normally would. So the longevity on these is gonna last much longer than it would on a felt tip highlighter. Um, and depending on the width of whatever it is you're trying to highlight, you can get different versions of them and so on. Um, that's what the different colors represent. So uh, these are great alternatives. They're $10, they're really good. Um, you can reload the cartridges they come with with an ink syringe with a highlighter ink, or you can get a pilot Con 50 or Con 20 converter and fit that on here. Um, so for a total cost of no more than $15, you can get set up with a highlighter that's really gonna last you pretty much forever. Um, and so that's pretty cool to be able to do that. Um, and then you can clean it out and just maintain it like you would your normal fountain pen. So that's kind of cool. Um, but uh, the second part of your question you had was, can you use it over top of some other fountain pen ink? And it's gonna be basically, you know, the answer is maybe. It depends on the ink and it depends on how long it's been sitting there and stuff like that. If you're taking an ink and you're writing something and then you're highlighting right over top of it, um, chances are it's gonna run and smear on you a little bit. If you're using a fountain pen ink that is waterproof, chances are much less likely that it's gonna run. Still not 100% though, because um, some fountain pen inks, like a lot of the Noodler's ones, are, are cellulose reactive. They take time. They need to absorb into the paper to truly become steadfast and permanent. So if you're writing something and then going back 30 seconds later and highlighting over top of it, that ink is still going to be wet. It's going to smear pretty much no matter what it is. Platinum Carbon Black, I think, is some of the best stuff because it's a pigmented ink. It dries more on top of the paper. It doesn't soak in. So if you need to be able to write something quickly and highlight over top of it, Carbon Black is probably going to be your better bet to be able to do that. But pretty much look at you know, water resistant inks, you can filter that by uh, gulepens.com. You can read some reviews and stuff like that. Not all inks are created equal. Not all of them are 100% water resistant. Um, some of them, you know, inks are made of lots of different dyes and components. Some of them, like some of the components are more ink or water resistant than others. So you might get one of the components of the colors that would run a little bit when you highlight over top of it and so on. So there's a lot of variables. The paper too, if it's really slick paper, it's gonna take longer to dry, longer to absorb, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, if you're looking like a textbook that's got like a slick feel to it, ugh, it's not gonna do as well. 
So you just want to, there's a lot of variables there, and paper is, is a factor as well. So I would say the carbon black probably is your best bet. Going with an extra fine nib if you can, and then using a parallel with highlighter ink. Firefly, Nublix Firefly is my favorite highlighter ink. It's just a general like yellow highlighter ink. But I think that will be your best setup for success there. Okay, Donovan? Cool. All right, Clay Hudon on YouTube. Hope I pronounced that right, Clay. I really like gray ink, but a lot of gray inks are not inexpensive. So I was wondering what your opinion on getting black ink and mixing it with some water. So basically diluting the black so that it looks gray. Can you do that? Yes, you can, technically. Um, I don't really like to do that, personally. But then again, I'm not normal. I have access to a lot of already great mixed fountain pen inks. So I would say, <clears throat> first thing I want to say is, yes, it's possible. Um, play around with it. Do it in small quantities. Don't just take your whole bottle of ink and start dumping water in there. Because then you're like, oh, this doesn't really work like I hoped it would. Or it really affects the flow or the dry time. And I don't like that. And now I have this whole bottle that's ruined. And it's all Brian's fault. Don't do that. Okay? So whatever you do, it's your fault. I'm just giving you knowledge. Okay? So do it in small quantities. If you have an ink sample vial or something like that. Which I need to grab. But here it is. If you have one of these. Put a couple of milliliters of ink in here, start diluting it with a little bit of water. Start out maybe like 10% water, then go like 25%, 50%. See what degree of gray you're looking for. It's gonna depend on the ink too, have what ratio you'll need because different black inks are different levels of saturation, so it's gonna depend on the brand. Um, you said in there that gray inks are not inexpensive. That threw me a little bit because there's no premium on gray inks than any other colors of ink. So um, I don't know. I, I think maybe what you're saying is like, you don't want to have to buy another just plain gray ink. You just don't want to buy another ink, I guess, um, because there's no, there's no premium of gray inks. No, there's lots of good gray ink options that are pretty affordable. My for personal favorite is Noodler's Lexington Gray. You know, it's not that expensive, especially for the volume that you're getting. Um, and you can get it in a four and a half ounce bottle as well, if you want even more utility. Um, so definitely check those out. Lexington Gray, it's also um, water resistant. So that's a good one. And then there's lots of other good private reserve as gray flannel, diamine's got some, they're, they're not as affordable because they just went on a price hike a couple months ago. Um, but even still for the grand scheme of things, if you're gonna be using a lot of gray ink, over time, it's not going to be that expensive. So I think that you'll have, uh, a, it's definitely true that some of the more expensive brands like Eroshizuku and stuff like that, maybe that's some of what you're hearing about is some of those more expensive ones that have some great inks. But there's there's great ink options in all of the more affordable, um, you know, companies anyway. It's not always like inks that come from pen companies, like I'm thinking like Schaefer and Lamy and, and stuff like that. They don't have any grays. But you can usually find grays with the boutique companies like Noodler's, Pride Reserve, Diamine, Detrimentus, stuff like that. Um, so check some of those out, but it's not, that, uh, it's not that gray ink is any more expensive than any other. It's just that maybe some of the gray inks that you're hearing talked about just happen to fall in the more expensive brands. Um, but definitely check some of those other ones out I mentioned. Uh, all right, James R. on Facebook said, so I was wondering if you were able to take an invisible permanent ink, like Noodler's Blue Ghost, and leave that in a celluloid pen for a while. Would it stain the pen with the invisible ink and help protect against other inks from staining it, since theoretically all the celluloid would have reacted with Blue Ghost? This is, uh, this is a very interesting question, I'll be honest with you. Um, I've never heard of anyone trying this, basically trying to intentionally stain the ink or sorry, intentionally stain the pen with one ink color so that it wouldn't be stained by others. In this case, I'm, I'm purely having to go off of theory here. Um, I don't know that two wrongs would make a right in this case, so I would say probably not. I think the, the idea behind what you're shooting for here uh, is interesting, but I don't know that it would actually work in practicality. I think probably what would end up happening is you would get some parts that would be stained in one color and some parts that might be stained in another, or the two would react together, or the Noodler's Blue Ghost would just not even appear as anything, and the other color would just come through and stain anyway. I think that's more likely the case. 
Now, some of you are asking, what the heck is celluloid, blah, 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 blah. Celluloid is derived from a natural material, so when you have certain types of ink, like cellulose reactive, Noodler's permanent inks, there's a potential for them to be stained because it's reacting with the inside of the pen. Now, it's really only an issue when you have a pen that's translucent in color, a celluloid pen that's translucent, and it's a piston-filling pen or a vacuum-filling pen where the ink itself is actually touching the celluloid. Or, I guess, if you have a celluloid grip and you're dipping it into the bottle of ink, okay, that could definitely stain it. But um, it's not going to be, it's not going to be in, you know, it's not like the ink getting on it is going to immediately stain it. You're going to wipe it away and clean it off, and so it's not going to really soak in and have the time necessarily to do that. So that's not necessarily quite as much the issue. I still think it's a better idea if you have a celluloid pen to just stay away from the cellulose reactive inks, just because, which is basically any Noodler's permanent ink. Really, permanent inks in general is probably just a better idea to stay away from it with celluloid, because generally those pens are really expensive too. Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyway, I think your idea is interesting, but I don't know... I don't know how that would work out, to be quite honest with you. And I don't really want to test it on any of my celluloid pens, just to be completely honest with you. So I think it's an interesting theory. Maybe if any of you have happened to already do that for some reason, you could let me know. I think that would be interesting. But great question, James. Sorry I don't have a great answer. All right, business question. This is from Tartan Hearts on Twitter. Is there a particular reason you don't upload videos to Facebook? Um, it is something we've been experimenting a little bit more lately. We have been uploading some to Facebook, not uh, everyone, not all of them. It's, it's a relatively new thing, being able to direct upload to Facebook. Um, we're still playing around with it, um, so I'm interested in it. Part of the reason we don't uh, focus as much on videos on Facebook is because Facebook does not syndicate out your content that you upload to all of your fans they make you pay to do that by what's called boosting. So basically, when we post something on our page, whether it's a video or anything really, uh, only about three to 5% of the people who have chosen to follow our page will even see it, like get in their notification timeline, whatever. If you go directly to our fan page, then yes, you can see all of our content, but it doesn't show up in your feed unless we pay for it too, basically, even if you're already following our page. And that's something that Facebook started doing kind of a while ago, two years ago, I think. So, um, you know, it, it has been such that over time they've been, you know, deprioritizing that as something because everybody's news feeds are getting filled up more these days. And so they're like, well, we don't really want to cram your stuff in people's feeds. Uh, if you want to be seen there, you need to pay. So I'm um, toyed around with that a little bit, but just something that just doesn't feel right to me, having to pay to put it in your feed when you've already chosen to follow us and stuff like that. But, you know, hey, Facebook's got to make money, right? Um, so we've toyed around with that a little bit. But that said, we're still putting some videos on Facebook. It's getting, it's doing okay, so we'll, we'll do some for sure. But, you know, we have, huh, I don't know, 800 videos? I, I don't even know how many videos we have now at this point. I need to count them up one of these days. But seven to 800 videos probably on YouTube. So if we were to upload all of those to Facebook, it would cram your feed or cram our page filled with videos for months if we were to upload that. So I'm still trying to figure out exactly what to do with that. But if you have any feedback on that in particular, if you want us to see, uh, to put more videos on there, let us know what types of videos you prefer to have on Facebook and we'll consider doing that. But um, we have been playing around with some of the shorter ones like Q&A slices, some of our shorter videos um, has been good. We, we just have more of a following on YouTube. YouTube's a little more natural, it's a little more searchable and stuff like that. So it, it works out a little better, it's more of our focus, but I'm certainly open to going where, wherever the people are. So if more people want to see our videos on Facebook, we'll start going on Facebook. So I'm open to it. All right, got a paper question here. This is from Lauren M on Facebook. Any plans to carry fountain pen friendly or higher quality versions of normal office paper products such as yellow legal and letter pads, post-it notes, or three subject notebooks? I need the functionality of these basic office supplies, but I'm having trouble finding versions nicer than the things that we used in high school. Well, Lauren, I totally hear you. Um, I don't... Have, this is like a theme of Q&A here of like, Brian doesn't really have a great answer for you. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a great answer for you because um, 
a lot of the paper that we get, uh, all of the paper that we get basically it comes from outside the US. So that said, our paper standards and sizes and uses are all very different than what's used in Japan or in France or in the UK or wherever the paper might come from. So um, not only is the sizing and ruling and stuff generally different in these other countries, but the formats and the ways that they might get used are slightly different as well. So in other countries, for example, the hole punch pattern is completely different in France than it is in the US. You know, so if we look to get any like loose leaf paper or whatever, it's gonna be like a five hole punch instead of a three. It's gonna be kind of different. So they end up doing multi hole, which can take a three, four or five punch. And then there's just holes all over the side and it just looks a little weird and people don't wanna buy it. So um, there are some things out there, like we've tried to carry stuff before, like Claire Fontaine has this twin book. Um, which basically just had kind of acts like a multi-subject. We carried these for a little bit and nobody really bought them, so we dropped them a while back. I just had that one sitting there, over there on my desk right now. Um, but, you know, there's been some other stuff, like Rhodia, for example, does have a yellow Rhodia pad. You know, so it's kind of like a legal pad, but with Rhodia paper. Now, granted, it's going to cost you like five times what a yellow legal pad is going to cost, some generic whatever legal pad, but it's going to be Rhodia paper, which is awesome. Um, so that said that we don't carry that. We used to, nobody bought it, so we dropped it. Um, it's R19660. So just look up the product code, Rodeo 19660. Somebody out there might have it somewhere and you can go find it. Sorry, it's not me, but somebody out there might have it. So you can check that out. Um, and then other things we asked, like post-it notes, you know, in the subject notebooks and stuff, post-it notes would be great. I don't know of anybody who makes half-decent writing post-it notes. Um, so I just end up writing on post-it notes and just having it look terrible. Um, and some of the other things I hear is like index cards and stuff like that. Um, not a lot of great one. We have Exacompta index cards, which are good, very good quality paper, but they're all colored and have grid paper on them and stuff. And they're not, not my ideal choice for if I was to like have my ideal index card with fountain pen friendly paper. Um, I hear that Levenger has some that are pretty decent. Staples might have some in their Sustainable Earth series, I'm not sure. Staples might be a good option for you to try. Um, I hear decent things about them. Or maybe Black and Red is another brand. These are all brands I don't carry now, so you're going, you're on your own looking for these ones. Um, but uh, check those out. Black and Red is pretty affordable. I've seen it at Office Max and maybe some other office supply store type places that you can check those out. Um, but their paper is actually half decent and it's like American size and stuff like that. So they might have some options for you. I don't know if they have multi-subject stuff though. They're more just like journals and wire balance and stuff like that, but could be something for you to try. But um, I will say that, you know, Claire Fontaine and not as much Rodeo, more Claire Fontaine has a lot of these like subject notebook type things a lot of them aren't brought into the U.S. You know, Claire Fontaine has a catalog that's like this thick for France. Only a fraction of that is actually imported into the U.S. Because you can imagine anytime you bring in a new product into the U.S., you know, the U.S. distributor has to buy these things by like the, I mean, they literally get like cargo container loads full of paper. So you can imagine when they carry several new products, you got to have pallets of this stuff to be able to ship it all over the U.S. So they can't carry everything that Claire Fontaine makes. It's just not practical. Um, and so there's a lot of that organizational type stuff that I think is, is too niche, too narrow for um, the U.S. market, especially the, because it's more made for the way that you know French students in school might use them, which could be different than it is here in the U.S. So not a lot of like, you know, Mead five star three subject notebook type of things going on in France. They do things a little bit differently. Um, there are definitely some options, um, but for the cost of what it would get to take to get them from France and all that kind of stuff, it's just not really worth it. So I hate to say I don't have great options for you, but that is at least some knowledge that you can put into your brain tank. Okay. I'm gonna take on some troubleshooting questions here. I got a couple of them. All right. Um, this question from Nico L on Facebook. I seem to have magically gotten ink behind my Monteverde clear ink cartridge converter. Is it possible to clean behind the plunger without breaking it? Yes. Yes, it is. I just tested it this morning, actually. Um, let me zoom in a little bit so I can show you what's going on. 
Now, the Monterey Clear Ink Converter is a little bit different than, excuse me, a little bit different than the normal standard international cartridge converter. So, give me a second here. Is that not focusing? How about that? I think I might have manual focus on here. Yep, sure do. Sure do have manual focus. Nope, oh, maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right, it's probably faster for me to just sit back. And okay, there we go. So you can see that well enough, right? Go ahead, zoom, sit back a little further. Okay, so you can see that. Here is the Monteverde Clear Ink Cartridge Converter. So it's a little bit different than your standard, standard international cartridge converter that you may be familiar with. It's a little bit shorter. The ink capacity is a little bit lower. Um, there's certain Monteverde pens like the Artistic Crystal that this comes with. Um, also, if there's some pens that are just a little bit too short to fit a standard international, um, sometimes this one can get you out of a bind in that way. So basically, if you need to clean it out, it's very easy. You just grab the metal shroud here, and it just unscrews. Now, it might, be, it might take a little bit of force to get it undone the first time, but you just unscrew it, and this shroud will eventually kind of come off. It'll kind of break out into these little pieces here. And then you can just like pull out the pieces, clean it, yada, yada, yada. Now you do have to put it back on in a certain way. This little white piece um, needs to go on and it needs to fit in place. This little white piece has all these little like kind of prongs on the side here. Forgive me for not having great detail, but, um, and then it just slides into place like so. And of course I dropped the piece on the floor. <clears throat> Brian's on fire today. Okay, and then the cover goes back on here, so this part threads on, and then the shroud kind of holds it all into place. So, not sure if that's super clear, but basically the same concept as all the other converters that I've uh, taken apart over the years. Um, but then you just unscrew it like that. I do recommend if you have any silicone grease, throw a little silicone grease on the piston seal before you put it back together, and then you should be in good shape. That, my friends, is how it's done for that specific converter. Okay, looking good. But worst case, if you can't get this thing cleaned out and you break it or you lose a piece on the floor like I did or drop it in your sink or whatever, this converter is $3.50. It's not the end of the world if you have to replace it. Ideally, you don't want to have to do that. But, um, but if you do have ink behind there, it's not really going to affect the performance or anything like that. Um, you know, it's just, it's just going to get a little bit behind there and then you just kind of have to look at it and that's about it. Um, so that's about all that there is to say about that. Sound like Forrest Gump there. Last question I have for this week is going to be a little bit shorter Q&A today. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, Jody M on Facebook asked me, my Quaco Classic Sport keeps skipping and starting to write mid-stroke. I've cleaned it, aligned the tines, flossed to separate the tines a little bit more, and am writing correctly. Any solutions? Um, so yes, anytime you have a pen like this that's not writing well, uh, you always start out with some of the basics, um, which it sounds like you've really done. Um, first thing is to make sure you filled the pen properly, um, especially with a cartridge converter pen like this. Um, whenever it's skipping and kind of starting issues like that, sorry, I said cartridge converter, but there's not a really a good converter that fits this pen because it's so small. So it's really a cartridge pen. Whenever you have a cartridge pen, it always, when you load the cartridge in, it takes a little bit for that ink to work its way through the feed and really load this thing up. Um, it can literally take like minutes, sometimes like five minutes even. Um, so if you load a cartridge in and you're trying to like shake it and write with it and it's kind of writing and starting and stuff like that, I, I think Jody, by the nature of your question, you have a little more experience and you're not, you know, dealing quite with this, but this is more for anybody else's sake that, you know, it doesn't have a lot of experiences with pens. Um, if you are having flow issues with your pen, especially if it's a cartridge pen like this, that cartridge is going to take a while for the ink to flow through. And it might start a little bit and kind of break up and then it kind of need to work its way through. It can take a little bit. Sometimes if you have the cartridge and you can like squeeze the back of the cartridge a little bit, it can help to flood the feed a little bit, get things moving along. Um, don't squeeze too hard because you don't want to break the thing or force it and have it drip out all over the place, but um, that can help to encourage the ink, I think we'll all say. Um, and then once you get it flowing, writing, really you'll need to write like a full page before you can really determine how like 
well the thing is actually writing. And if you're starting to run into some flow issues, then I would say, okay, take the cartridge out, whatever, go ahead and clean it. Because sometimes there's machining oils and sometimes there's stuff like that that can be in the pen upon its initial whatever, uh, birth, creation, whatever you want to call it, um, that can impede the flow of ink. So cleaning it, technically you should probably clean it before you ink it up for the first time. That's always a good practice, but um, I think that it's a good idea um, to do that. However, I don't always have the patience personally. So more speaking from personal experience, usually when I get a new pen, I'm too excited and I just want to ink it up and write with it. Um, but if I ever run into any flow issues, I'm like, all right, let me go clean it. So then I clean it 90% of the times, that'll fix it. But you've also done that. So I'm just leaving you in suspense here. You aligned the tines, that's good. That just means that the tines are not out of whack or anything like that. That can affect flow, but that has more to do with whether it's scratchy feeling or not. Um, unless you have like the tines are splayed apart like this. Um, this is me, you're looking at the, the nib like this. If the tines are like whoosh, spread apart like that, then you can have flow issues. Um, but that usually is not going to be the case on a new pen like that. Um, it should look pretty good. Um, and let's see here, you floss the tines, separate a little bit more, okay. So any other solutions? I imagine probably what you're dealing with, and this is more what I've seen on broad nib Quakos. I don't know what nib size you have, I kind of wish I did. Um, but on broad ones, maybe even some of the mediums, I do see um, issues with baby's bottom, what's called baby's bottom which is basically where the nib, um, if you're looking straight at the nib again, like this, like I'm gonna poke you in the eye with the nib. You're looking straight at me here. So if I have, you know, I'm a nib right now. You know, I am harnessing my inner nib. Um, you're looking straight at the tip of the nib, which is my hands here. If you have it where the tines of the nib are aligned, and that's great, but if you have it where it's too rounded on the inside here, you know, a lot of times it'll be rounded on the inside so that when you're writing with it, it's gonna feel really smooth. That's good, you want it to be, be like that. But if it's too rounded, then what happens is there's too much of a gap here right at the bottom where you would be normally have the paper. Ink works by capillary action. So it's flowing down from the body in between the tines and then the final destination is going from the tip of that nib, touching the paper and then going onto the paper which if you have a normal writing nib, there should be a little bit of space at the bottom, a little bit of roundedness on the inside of that nib. But if it's too much, that's what's known as baby's bottom. And it looks like a butt. That's why I say that. And my kids would laugh if they heard me say that because I don't let them say that. I make them say bottom. Uh, but anyway, so if you have too much of a gap there, it's gonna feel remarkably smooth, but you're not gonna be able to, <laughs> I said butt, but you're not gonna be able to um, write consistently with it unless you're adding additional pressure. And the reason the additional pressure works is because then you're forcing more ink to flow down and then it's able to break that, that breakage of the capillary action and keep flowing. So if you have a pen write like, like that, that writes really smooth, but you're dealing with some issues where it's sometimes skipping at start, startup, excuse me, has startup issues, or it'll just kind of periodically break up, especially when you write in certain strokes, I would say that's usually a candidate for baby's bottom. You can't really confirm it until you like pull out your loop and go and look at it and see, oh my gosh, there's so much of a gap there. Um, but that's usually gonna be the case. And I, I specifically point to that because I've seen that on some of the broader nib Kawikos from time to time. Not all of them, but every now and then. Um, and it's exacerbated sometimes by the ink. Sometimes wetter inks just really don't have a problem with it. Sometimes drier inks do. Sometimes if you have a really ink resistant paper, it's not helping to like suck the ink out of the pen quite as much and you can have more skipping issues than you would on a more absorbent paper. So there's a lot of different factors here that I don't really know about in your particular situation, but it sounds like you've done a lot of things right. I would say the point you're at now is you may want to consider exchanging the pen if, unless you want to get into some like tuning, tweaking kind of stuff. Now, if you have a little bit of micro mesh, you can fix the baby's bottom yourself. It's not that hard. Um, I have a video on the Goulet micro mesh, and basically you take the micro mesh, you hold the pen like you're writing in your hand with it inked up, and you just do kind of figure eight patterns. Um, and then eventually it'll kind of wear it down and it'll get it to be right well. Um, that's a super oversimplified <laughs> version of it. And you know, if it was a $300 pen, I would say probably don't try that, but it's a Kaweco. It's 
it's a still a relatively affordable pen. Your pen's always, it's already kind of giving you some issues anyway. So maybe consider exchanging it wherever you got it. If you got it from us, we'll be happy to help you out. Um, if you didn't get it from us or if it's outside your window of being able to return it, then you may want to consider the micro mesh and just try tweaking it yourself. Cause it could, if you know what you're doing and you, you know, are able to do those figure eight patterns in the micro mesh, it really doesn't take that long, a couple of minutes probably, and you can fix your pen. So, um, you know, you don't want to use a lot of pressure when you're doing it, but just light pressure and kind of go back and forth with it and stuff like that uh, could really save your pen. So I think based on everything that you've said here, that's probably the situation that you're in. Um, if you also want to, you can check out, I know Stephen Brown's got a good video on fixing baby's bottom. I think Matt Armstrong from the Pen Habit has one. I'm not recalling exactly. I wish I looked it up ahead of time, but check out if he's got one. Um, I'm like overdue for doing a video on fixing baby's bottom uh, and I need to work on that. But um, that I think is the situation with which you are faced, Jody. And this is like gonna set a record in a long time for a shortest Q&A. Again, I didn't get a ton of questions um, for this past week, but you know, it's okay. It's okay, We've uh, I've taken much of your life in these Q&As so far, so. Uh, make sure you keep asking questions because otherwise I will not talk as long. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, conciseness is not exactly a gift of mine. So that said, I'm going to end a little early this week. So I do have a question of the week for you. Um, and this is kind of referring back to one of the earlier questions um, from Lauren here. Um, I want to know what everyday paper, like office supply type product, do you wish that you could find in a more fountain pen friendly version? Uh, I'm not going to say that I can provide it for you, but I'm, I am interested to know because I do get asked from time to time about sticky notes and index cards and that kind of stuff. Um, what what normal kind of office supply related thing do you really wish was made more for fountain pens? And maybe I'll see what I can do. But knowledge is power. And the more you know, PSA, do 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 do, whatever. I don't know. I'm getting, getting punchy. Uh, so let me know in the comments and I would love to hear about that. Um, I'll be back next week with another normal style q and I think. I don't know. Who knows what could happen in the next couple of weeks as I'm planning it all out, but we shall see. All right. That is all for now. Thank you so much. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. And uh, don't forget to tell me about Facebook videos if you do want some of those on there. I kind of alluded to that earlier. Um, and also give me some feedback on the uh, last couple of Q&As too. Make sure to go back and watch Q&A 100 and 101. It would be great. Thanks so much for watching and right on.